Hello, everyone. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Executive Director of Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island. Welcome to the final installment of our 23rd annual public lecture series. Metcalf Institute has been fostering informed public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We take a variety of approaches to this work. We offer science training for professional journalists from around the world such as our annual science immersion workshop for journalists, which is just concluding this week. We offer communication training for scientists from graduate students through professionals. We organize the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, <clears throat> excuse me, which brings people together from across the country to share practices and research that make science communication more inclusive and equitable. And we offer public events like this one. This is a very different year for us, of course, as it is for everyone. Because of the pandemic, we moved our annual science immersion workshop for journalists and this public lecture series online. This required many changes, but it also offered the opportunity to pivot in some important ways. Originally, this lecture series was going to explore the practical implications of climate change, specifically, we wanted to feature speakers who could discuss the ways we're already witnessing climate change and what we could expect to see with a global average temperature increase of two degrees Celsius, which is the limit that the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015 was designed to achieve. As the coronavirus began to spread and it became clear that COVID-19 would significantly affect every aspect of our lives for the foreseeable future, we decided to expand the lecture series to look at how the pandemic might affect our responses to climate change. And then over the last month, the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony McDade, Rhea Milton, Dominique Fells, and Rayshard Brooks, among countless other Black Americans before them, forced a national reckoning with anti-Black violence and all the ways that racism is structurally embedded in our society. This conversation is painful, but essential. So we decided to pivot the lecture series again, this time to address the intersections of these three critical issues, climate change, COVID-19, and systemic racism. We acknowledge that we can only begin to scratch the surface of these issues in a one week webinar series, but we hope that these discussions will provide all of you with new insights and most importantly, ideas for action. Apropos of these goals, I would like to wish everyone a happy Juneteenth. As a reminder, Juneteenth marks the day in 1865 when U.S. General Gordon Granger rode to Galveston, Texas to affirm the abolishment of slavery in the U.S. This was the first time enslaved people in Texas had learned of their freedom, even though it was two years after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and two months after the end of the Civil War. While African Americans have celebrated this day for more than 150 years, it is only this year in 2020 that the holiday has received widespread recognition beyond black communities. We hope this year marks a lasting change, not only with regard to the celebration of this holiday, but with regard to how we consider our individual and collective roles in ending systemic injustice. With that introduction, I'm thrilled to introduce today's lecture and our speaker. Climate change is often discussed as the great equalizer, which is really inaccurate. It's better described as the great magnifier because it magnifies existing inequities. COVID-19 has really crystallized that point with Black, Indigenous, and Latino communities in the United States disproportionately affected by the virus. The pandemic has also shown how critical it is to develop clear and consistent communication about large-scale public health issues whether they're caused by a virus or the burning of fossil fuels. Today, we'll hear from Dr. Christy Ebay, one of the world's foremost experts on the public health effects of climate change. Dr. Ebay has conducted research and practice on these issues for nearly 25 years, looking at the ways that extreme events, heat stress, foodborne safety and security, vector-borne diseases, and undernutrition affect human health. Dr. Ebay, who is a professor of environmental, occupational, and global health at the University of Washington, focuses on understanding the sources of vulnerability, as well as estimating current and projecting future health risks of climate change, and designing adaptation policies and measures to reduce those risks. She has helped nations in Central America, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific 
to assess their vulnerability and implement adaptation measures. Dr. Ebai was a lead author for the 2018 IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming, and also for the fourth US National Climate Assessment. She co-chairs the International Committee on New Integrated Climate Change Assessment Scenarios. She's edited four books on climate change, and she has published a lengthy list of scientific publications. We're especially grateful that Dr. Ebai could make time for us now when she's been inundated with requests to comment on the intersections of climate change and COVID-19. And with that, I am very happy to turn the mic over to Christy Ebai. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that kind introduction. And I want to thank everybody for attending the session. And I particularly want to thank Sunshine and her team for all the effort it took to move this from an in-person to an online meeting. It is a significant effort and you and your team have done a terrific job. So thank you very much for that. I wanna start with one of my summary points, which is climate change is affecting children. When you think about the health risks of a changing climate, about 85% of those impacted are children. In the United States, when you say climate change, people tend to think about polar bears. And I really hope by the end of this that you'll remember that climate change affects children. I also wanna take this moment to honor Professor Kirk Smith, who passed away Monday evening. Kirk was the person who helped all of us understand the significant health risks of indoor air pollution, particularly in India and in low-income countries where women and children cook over a variety of different materials that generate particles that damage their lungs. I don't know anyone else who's directly affected hundreds of millions of people. He was a phenomenal researcher and a very good colleague, and we really, really miss him. With that, I'm going to provide a very brief summary of a couple of points that are important when we think about climate change and health. I'm sure you've seen these slides before, so I won't spend much time on them. This is the evolution of global mean surface temperature from pre-industrial out into the near future. This is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report on Warming of 1.5 Degrees. And a couple of key points is one, starting sometime about 1980, perhaps a little bit before, you can see a shift in the steepness of the curve. The rate of climate change now is faster than it's been in more than 10,000 years. So we're in a period of very rapid change in temperature. The second is when you look at the projections in green, the projections are that under current emissions, that the earth could warm to 1.5 degrees between about 2030 and 2052. And so that is in the very near term. And as I'll say repeatedly throughout this, health systems are not prepared to be able to manage this rapid change that we're undergoing. The previous slide showed the evolution of temperature. This was across a range of climate models. There are quite a large number of climate models. They are ways to understand how the various elements of the climate system interact to move temperature around the earth so that we don't just have the tropics being heated by the sun, but we move that temperature around. This work was done for the same special report by Sonia Senevaratne. And what Sonia did in this modeling is take a look at these climate models and looked at just when the models reached 1.5 degrees of warming above pre-industrial. 
So there's no question about the evolution of temperature. This is when the temperatures have warmed to 1.5 degrees. And then looking at the one hottest day in the year, looked across the models at what those projections said within the individual models. The figure on the left shows you the lower quartile of distribution of the climate models. So the Earth has warmed 1.5 degrees, but in what's labeled as C, you can see that particularly the United States, almost no change in our temperatures with another half degree of warming. The Earth has already warmed at least one degree. The right-hand side is the upper quartiles of the same models. And this shows that with another half degree of warming, the United States could have warmed somewhere between three and five degrees. And I want to emphasize these are equally probable. We don't know which of these two worlds we could be in. These are not the extremes, these are the quartiles. And much of what's been done in adaptation in health and frankly adaptation more broadly is assuming we're going to be in a best case scenario without really taking on board this high degree of uncertainty about what our future is going to look like over the next couple of decades. As you know, it's not just changes in the mean temperature, it's also changes in the extremes. The left figure shows you the stylized figure we all use to talk about how a shift in the mean temperature leads to greater extremes, in this case, extreme heat. What the observations tell us, though, is that this figure is not just moving uniformly. The height is being pushed down. And on the right-hand side, you see a much greater increase in extreme heat. The right-hand figure is also work that was done for an Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report. And in this work, the authors divided the world into 26 world regions, asked what was the one hottest day between 1985 and 2005, and then under moderate emissions, RCP 4.5, high emissions, RCP 8.5, for June, July, and August, or the equivalent thereof in the Southern Hemisphere, looked at how often those temperatures would occur. In the first row, you see 2016 to 2035, basically now, and under high emissions, which is where the world has been until COVID-19, you could see that parts of the tropics were starting to see that temperature not once every 20 years, but once every year on average. And then you can see as we proceed through the century, if we can keep to moderate emissions, even by mid-century, a significant portion of the world will have very different kinds of temperatures than they do today. This matters not just because of temperature, but also because of pre precipitation. In the upper left, you can see that when you have warmer air, you have greater water vapor. Basically, it gets more humid. You have more water vapor in the air. And then when you have storms, you have more rain in the storms. On the right was the flood outlook for last year from March to May showing that there was a projection of extreme spring flood risk. And the bottom left, you can see part of what happened to the Midwest. There were parts of the Midwest that did not dry out for months and months. Crops were destroyed, farmers were unable to plant, which has mental health consequences besides the devastating impacts on livelihoods. And with that, I'll talk a little bit about some of the health risks of a changing climate. In the middle, you can see factors that we are concerned about from rising CO2 itself to impacts on temperatures, extreme weather, and sea level. Around that are some of the exposures that are important for our health. And in the outer circle, you can see the list of most but not all of the health concerns of a changing climate. I spent a lot of my time in low and middle income countries, and these are all issues that are dealt with in ministries of health. 
and they are most of the issues that are dealt with in ministries of health. This cuts across all the concerns of ministries and departments of health. So it's a cross-cutting issue. As Sunshine said, that this is an issue that is a stress multiplier. It increases challenges across a whole range of systems and across a whole range of health outcomes. We know that exposure and resilience vary across populations and communities. This figure was from the fourth National Climate Assessment, and it gives you a sense of some of the communities that we know are at greater risk with some comments about what can be done to help reduce that exposure, increase that resilience. So we have a good base of knowledge. This is a reminder, it's not just our health that's being affected by climate change, it's also our healthcare infrastructure. These are figures also from the fourth National Climate Assessment for Charleston and Miami, showing under different assumptions about hurricanes and floodings from hurricanes, the number of hospitals that could be flooded. This is repeated around our coastlines. We have far too many places that are at high risk. The left is one of the key summaries from the fourth national climate assessment that adaptation reduces risks and it improves our health. That there is a lot that can be done in the short and the long term to increase overall resilience to a changing climate. And with that, I'm going to talk about a few of the health risks, not all of them. That would take far more time than we have. More than happy to answer questions at the end. This is heat. This is just a random photograph from Phoenix when they had one of their days that was about 120 degrees a couple of summers ago. Just somebody's garbage left out in the street. The first major heat wave to capture quite a bit of attention in public health was the Chicago heat wave of 1995. The heat wave occurred during an event called the Taste of Chicago. It goes on for a couple of weeks down by Lake Michigan. It has carnival rides, performers. It's quite an event. The heat wave occurred, as I said, during the Taste of Chicago. There was about 600 or so excess deaths. That means about 600 more people died during that time period than one would have expected. And this is a photograph taken behind the coroner's office. It shows three of the nine refrigerated trucks the city or vendors brought in to provide food for the taste of Chicago to hold all the bodies that the coroner's office could not hold. These have significant consequences, not just for individuals and their families, but also for how we manage these large events. In 2003, there were a few heat waves in Europe after those events occurred and one had access to the death certificates. It was clear that more than 70,000 excess deaths occur from heat waves. We are vulnerable to high temperatures. Our body physiologically can't handle high temperatures. Some people are more vulnerable, particularly those with underlying disease, people who are older, older adults are much more at risk, and others. And yet at the same time, we know that all heat-related deaths are eventually preventable. People don't need to die in heat waves. So this is an area where there's been quite a bit of research and intervention recently to try and reduce the burden of heat on these preventable deaths. And it's not just deaths. There's a range of other consequences from higher temperatures. These are some very unfortunate statistics you can see from 2018 on the number of children who die of heat stroke because they're left in automobiles. Parents with the best of intentions go to a store, say, I'm just going to leave the baby in the car for a minute while I go buy some milk. And they don't understand how fast cars heat up and how poorly babies' bodies are designed to handle that increase in temperature. 
So you can see over 17 years, over 800 children died from heat stroke. These are completely preventable. There is now more messaging to try and really get people to understand that they can't do this, that it really damages children and is a practice that does need to be stopped. For all the health risks of a changing climate, there are interventions that can reduce these risks, make us better prepared for higher temperatures. Heat action plans are being implemented around the world. This is one from Ahmedabad in India. You can see it was implemented in 2013. It is a very comprehensive plan that is being replicated throughout India and through other low and middle income countries. I happened to be at the first meeting of developing this heat action plan. One of the people we met with was the head of a hospital. Ahmedabad is in a very hot and dry area of India. It's close to Pakistan. And one issue raised by the head of the hospital is during a recent heat wave, recent when we were there, there had been, we'll just say there'd been some issues in the neonatal ward. And that's because it was an unair conditioned hospital. The neonatal ward was on the top floor of the hospital under a metal roof. One action they took to help increase their resilience to a changing climate is reorganize their hospital. And this is an illustration of when we think about what needs to be done, we need to take action on everything from how we think about the structure of our institution, the structure of our infrastructure, how, it, how we organize our work, where we have our work done, and how we manage the growing number of people being affected by a changing climate. The second issue I'd like to raise is likely the biggest health risk of a changing climate will be undernutrition. This is work that was done for another Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report published in 2014 and shows just for wheat, but this is also true for several cereal crops, what happens to the yield when there's changes in the local temperature. On the left, you see the temperate regions of the world and you can see that wheat yields don't change much with increases in local temperature. The blue and the red lines have to do with different assumptions about adaptation, but by and large, not much of a shift. On the right side is the tropics. Most of the cereal crops are growing at the thermal edge of their tolerance, which means any increase in local mean temperature is a decrease in crop yield. After many years of successfully reducing the number of people who are food insecure, Food insecurity has been rising for the last couple of years. The Food and Agriculture Organization says that climate change is one of the reasons that higher temperatures mean lower yields in places that are already have challenges with providing enough food for everyone to eat. On the left, you can see projections of climate change in 2030 and 2080 under low and high emissions, a range of climate models, and the overall message is there is variability across these models. And all of the models, except for one exception in low emissions in 2080, you see a decrease in crop yields. And some of these declines are very large. The right-hand side shows that decreases in crop yields leads directly to increases in stunting. Different study, different time periods, but very consistent results that you have less food, children have less to eat, and then you see an increase in stunting. And it's not just climate change itself. It's the carbon dioxide that is driving climate change. There are a number of field studies that show when we look at carbon dioxide concentrations that are twice pre-industrial, you can do this in controlled experiments out in the field, 
that there are a number of changes in plant in plants that are critically important for our health. So one is the plants become more water efficient. They don't need as much water, they absorb less water, which means they bring in less micronutrients from the soil. I outlined iron and zinc. I mentioned there's about 830 million people in the world who are food insecure. There are 2 billion people who've got micronutrient deficiencies. Iron deficiency anemia affects women and children around the world, including in the United States. The field experiments suggest that iron and zinc and others micronutrients that are important for our health decline five to 10%. So this could have a significant consequence for children and their health. Sorry, I thought I had another slide in there. The other way this is important is that as plants grow faster with more carbon dioxide, they bring more carbon into the plant, that in one category of plant, which is about 85% of our plants, you start seeing that within these plants, they change their physiology in ways that means there's lower protein and there's lower B vitamins. The numbers associated with these changes are very large. Projections suggest hundreds of millions of children in particular, but also women and men will be affected by changes in the nutritional quality of our food. Right now, worldwide, about 75% of calories come from cereal crops. So this is an important challenge that does need to be addressed. Moving on to vector-borne diseases, a topic always of interest. I'm not gonna go through all of this, but this is a graphic that shows you that temperature and precipitation basically affect where we see mosquitoes in this case. It also affects where we see ticks, how active they are. It determines aspects of their life cycle, how long do they live, and other factors that are important for the transmission of diseases by mosquitoes and ticks. This is particularly for dengue. The same mosquito also carries a disease called chikungunya, another viral disease. These are projections in Canada showing in the recent climate, short and longer term, projections for the change in the range where you could see this disease being transmitted. I particularly like this because it highlights near where I live in Seattle. And if there are projections that there is going to be Aedes aegypti in Vancouver, we're certainly gonna have it in Seattle. And you can see under high emissions, very big changes in the geographic range, which of course has profound implications for the rest of the Northern states in the US. And we are seeing in a number of places in the world where mosquitoes are starting to change their range. In Seattle, the first case of West Nile virus appeared in 2018. There's been concern for several years from the Department of Health. West Nile virus was the east of the Cascades. And as temperatures get warmer, as people travel more, as we have more commerce, across states, across countries. We're seeing introduction of mosquitoes. We're seeing introduction of viruses and setting up a situation where we are expecting to have more outbreaks of infectious diseases unless actions are taken to be much more proactive so we can prevent outbreaks before they become widespread. Again, as with heat wave early warning systems for infectious diseases, we can set up early warning systems based on the enormous amount of information that's available, environmental information that's available. These are some stylized curves. The top row shows you the difference between no surveillance when you don't try to see if the disease or the vector is there versus passive surveillance where if a disease case shows up, then it gets reported. And just having passive surveillance of trying to track what's going on 
you can see a big difference in the shape of the outbreak, the red versus the pink. And in the second row, you can see what happens when you have an, a surveillance system based on environmental information, where you're paying attention to how the environment is shifting and what that could mean for an outbreak. And so this shows you that you can get notification quite early on that you might have the environmental conditions conducive for an outbreak, have passive surveillance, switch into active surveillance when you really go out there and start looking for cases. And in that case, you can significantly reduce the curve. There is an example from Singapore that is in the process of implementing an early warning system for dengue fever for this particular mosquito, and it has a four month lead time. So there's four months where you can start warning pregnant women about not being bitten by mosquitoes, people cleaning up mosquito breeding sites, a number of actions that can be taken over those four months. So you don't have to see a large outbreak. I wanted to mention this in particular. This is also from the IPCC special report on warming of 1.5. I'll take a minute to explain each one of these figures. So each, for each one of these columns, and I'll start with warm water corals on the left, they start at pre-industrial, zero. The gray band that goes across is basically recent temperatures to show that we've warmed, the world has warmed to 1.5 degrees. Where the columns are white means that we have not, through observations, been able to detect whether the system has changed. We don't know if it's changed over time. When the color turns to yellow, it means the system has changed and science has been able to attribute at least some of that change to climate change. And then once you have yellow, as you get darker colors, you can see the risks become greater. For warm water corals, the, this particular report concluded that at warming of 1.5 degrees, that 60 to 90% of all, all warm water corals would be gone. By two degrees, they'd all be gone. So you can look across at these. I've got heat-related morbidity and mortality on the far right. What this doesn't say is changes in all of these systems affect our health. If we lose the warm water corals, we lose the fish that feed hundreds of millions of people around the world. Similar issue with small scale, low latitude fisheries. And so I could go across and there's not estimates of the health consequences of those shifts, but we know that those consequences are there and we do need more research to be able to better quantify what those consequences could be to prioritize interventions to make sure that we prevent as much of those problems as is possible. And I wanted to end with a few comments on mitigation. I didn't have the opportunity to list, listen to all of the webinars this week for which I'm sorry. I hope someone talked with you about the carbon budget. Based on three to four decades of research around a changing climate, how we think about, understand, and then be able to manage the shifts that are ongoing. There's been enormous amount learned about carbon and how it circulates around the world, how it moves across different media, how it moves from the atmosphere to the oceans, into rocks, et cetera. And based on all of that information, it's possible to set up a carbon budget. It's possible to say, I'd like to have a 66% chance to keep warming to two degrees C. In the figure on the right, you can see in black is the total budget. And then you start taking away what's already been emitted. The dark green is non-carbon dioxide emissions. The lighter green is past fossil fuel and industrial emissions. The light blue color is past land use change. And the bottom blue bar is the total budget that's remaining. These are why the negotiations are so intense. 
under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Low and middle income countries say, rightly so, that they've got a right to develop. Past development was based on fossil fuels and there needs to be a way for them to develop without emitting as much fossil fuels as US, China and others have done during our development. Something that's not widely known is in the United States, more of our emissions now are coming from transportation than are coming from point sources like coal fire power plants. So we do need to move forward in thinking about how to reduce emissions from tailpipes and how to move to more electric vehicles, for example. And what's infrequently talked about in the media is when you look at the mitigation policies of reducing emissions from coal fire power plants, of getting more people out of their cars, walking and biking, other ways that we can reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions, that those policies all have health benefits. And when you start adding up the health benefits in avoided hospitalizations, in avoided premature deaths, and then you value what that is, for those avoided impacts, then the health co-benefits of mitigation policies are of the same order of magnitude as the cost of mitigation. So when people talk about the cost of mitigation, they also should be talking about the health benefits associated with that, how we could reduce our healthcare costs, how people could have healthier lives. And that should be a real focus when we talk about mitigation we should be mitigating for our health. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Chris. That was a wonderful overview. And actually no one had explicitly talked about the carbon budget, so I'm really glad you did that. So, okay, um, everybody, please go ahead and submit your questions via the Q&A function. We have a few here already, so I'll jump in. Um, one of them is, this is actually a, a couple of variations on a theme from several people, which relates to farming practices. So uh, Rebecca asked if there are any practices that farmers can, can do to help make it more likely that people get those micronutrients. Are there any adaptation strategies for this? And a, a second variation on this farming theme is, what are the solutions to alleviate the decrease in yields? Um, so there's both like a, a very um, kind of, um, well, this is big in a lot of different ways, right? This is both in terms of health and in terms of economies and livelihoods. What can you tell us about that, Chris? Those are really good questions and I will attempt to provide partial answers. It's not my area of expertise. I do focus on the health issues. There is something called the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research that recently raised or attempted to raise about a billion dollars to take a look at answering particularly the yield question. So there is research going on, for example, in rice that identified hybrids of African and Asian rice that is more heat and drought tolerant. There is an effort to be implementing that through Africa. And that's just one of the examples that I know about, but there's a lot of research into the crops themselves and how we can make these crops more resilient to the situations they now find themselves in. There hasn't been an effort to take a look at what to do about the micronutrients. And that is a really fundamental challenge. As I mentioned, the, the crops are just absorbing less micronutrients. They don't need them. So we need those for our health, but the crops aren't absorbing them for our health, they're absorbing them for their health. And they're, they're not needing them. And I suppose there could be ways with biofortification and other techniques to increase the micronutrient content. But that doesn't address the problem of a 10% decline in protein. And I mentioned the B vitamins, the decline in B vitamins, particularly folic acid, is up to 30%, it's a huge decline. And there isn't yet an understanding because that's fundamental to the plant physiology. And the plant physiologists I talk with 
say we need significant investments to understand what it is we could do about that. Thank you. I um, appreciate you sharing that, even though it's not your area of expertise. Um, so here's another, now we're going to take this to a, a much bigger uh, question for you. Um, and that is, uh, in what ways can the healthcare system or can healthcare systems, I guess we should say, because obviously they vary from place to place, um, prepare themselves for uh, climate related illnesses? Is this a resource problem? Is this a lack of training? Is this a lack of prioritization? Other? Thank you very much for asking. This is one of my soapboxes and I was, I was very, I tried not to get up on my soapbox, but you asked me to do it. So I'm going to blame you for me getting up on my soapbox. There's several issues. One is when you look at investments in health systems and in research around climate change and health, it, everybody says you don't have enough. It is next to nothing. When you look internationally, there's a number of adaptation funds for low and middle income countries primarily to adapt to a change in climate. There has been probably close to $1.5 billion put into those funds. Of that, 0.5% has gone to health. And most of that is in two projects that are starting now. There's been almost no investment on that side. When you look at the research, I reviewed about a year ago the budget. So when you look at the National Institutes of Health, which has a mission mandate for protecting the health of Americans, 0.04% goes to climate change. Washington DC likes to talk about budget dust. 0.04% doesn't arise to dust. That funding level is fairly similar to what you see in the EU and what you see in Australia. It's not this administration. This has been going on for more than a decade. I reviewed funding in 2008 and it was, it's increased a little bit since 2008, but we're not making any investments. So that answer is, it's not only the resources, but the training that there are very few professionals in schools of public health who work in this issue because there's no funding. And so it's a real challenge on that side. And then on the other side, there is a lack of awareness and a lack of prioritization. As I mentioned, NIH, NIH is clearly not prioritizing this as an issue, although there's some indications maybe that might shift. And so other metrics you can use of antimicrobial resistance is a huge issue in health. And the climate change budget is 2% of what goes to antimicrobial resistance. So when you look at people who run NIHs of the world, the medical research councils, from my perspective, they take a medical model view of the world. And environment isn't really part of what they do. I've heard far too many statements from high level people that climate change is an environmental issue and therefore somebody else should handle it. It is, somebody else should be doing it but nobody else has the mission mandate. So we fall through the cracks, not prioritized by health, and we don't have the money. Yeah, okay, so those are three very, very large uh, problems to overcome. Do you think, Chris, that um, this possible shift in NIH funding that you just mentioned, um, is that at all related to our experience with COVID and finding ourselves fairly flat-footed on a predictable series of, of problems? No, totally but unrelated. no, but I'm happy to opine about COVID. There are a number of publications that received quite a lot of media attention saying in some variation that there's a few coronaviruses that are known and most of those are cold viruses, colds are seasonal. And so therefore, maybe COVID is going to be seasonal. There's been a few preliminary publications looking at temperature in COVID. 
that frankly are problematic because they're not including other drivers of emergence of infectious disease like trade and travel. So a couple of comments. We do need to understand how this particular virus could be affected by temperature and precipitation. Whether it will in fact be seasonal, we don't know. But we're in a pandemic. So even if it is seasonal, it's not clear that it's gonna make any difference in a pandemic. I'm sure you've all heard a lot, what we care about in public health is when you have a non-immune population, which we all, none of us really has immunity to COVID, and you introduce somebody who has the disease, one of the measures that we look for in public health is how many people can one person infect? And that's what's called r naught that's being discussed, even in the public, which I find fascinating. So we look at r naught, and there's lots of estimates with COVID of what r naught is. And the estimates are somewhere in the twos to as high as five. So even if COVID is seasonal and it reduces an R naught of three down to 1.5, we still have a pandemic. And so when you think about the cold viruses, people still have summer colds. People still share those summer colds with their family and friends. So just because a disease is primarily seasonal doesn't mean we don't see it in the quote unquote off season. So we need to be a little bit more nuanced in how we think about temperature, COVID, and what this could mean, for example, for a second wave, if we ever get through the first wave in the U.S. Right, right. Uh, okay, thank you for opining on that. Um, so switching gears here a little bit, Yerath asks, what, which zoonotic diseases do you think are going to be the biggest threats in the future? And can you start by explaining what a zoonotic disease is? A zoonotic disease is a disease that is transmitted from animals to humans. So thank you for bringing up the word zoonotic. There is a huge amount of research on zoonotic diseases. Many of the diseases we are concerned about are zoonotic. They originally were introduced to humans from animals. It's not just climate change, but also biodiversity loss in particular. And population growth means that there are more interactions between people and wildlife. That research has been relatively limited. There's a lot of work that's been done from Peter Dasik and the EcoHealth Alliance group on looking at bats, and Peter's been publishing for years about bats carry a whole bunch of viruses that he's been expressing concern could be transmitted to humans. And I need to make sure it's clear that it's not just that it's transmitted to humans, but that once it is transmitted to humans, that it then can be transmitted from person to person. So when you look at SARS, when you look at MERS, both of them are coronaviruses, there was transmission from a species to humans, but there was very poor human to human transmission. There was lots of discussion at the time of what would happen if there was person to person transmission and deep concern, but in fact, relatively little international effort. You see some countries, for example, South Korea, really handled COVID-19 well. And that's in part because of their experience with MERS, Mediterranean, Mediterranean Respiratory Syndrome. And they had a lot of experience with that. They had experience with SARS. And so they had a system where they thought about what they would do if there really was serious person-to-person -person transmission. And there's been various levels of effort in different countries. At the same time, there's been decline overall in funding for health systems over the last 20 years. And so we've become less able to manage these kinds of situations because we just are not emphasizing the funding that's needed to have robust health systems, to make sure that we've got training for public health workers, that we've got national stockpiles that we can have access to, so you've seen a huge variety in the response 
<clears throat> excuse me, and this just really highlights that as population continues to grow, as we have more biodiversity loss, as climate continues to change, we're setting up situations where it's more likely we'll see something else happen. This is something that personally my community has been talking about for 30 years. Getting to a more specific level in the United States, I'd be particularly concerned about all the diseases carried by Aedes aegypti, which as I mentioned before, is a disease could carry dengue, can carry chikungunya, can carry Zika virus, and can carry yellow fever. And that mosquito is changing its range. We've got anecdotal evidence, and it's changing its range much faster than expected. There were some uh, very detailed projections of where Aedes aegypti could move to in the United States with climate change. And those projections suggested that by 2080, you'd see Aedes aegypti throughout the Midwest up into Tennessee. We would see it up in the Pacific Northwest just because of our mild temperatures. And so we have these maps of what could happen based on what we know about the environmental determinants of where you see Aedes aegypti. And then two summers ago, we saw breeding colonies of this mosquito in Toronto, Toledo, and Detroit. So it's changing its range and we don't have good vector surveillance programs. Departments of health just don't have the capacity to track this. They don't have the people trained to manage it and on and on. That is, um, you've just answered this question in part, but that's a, a very nice segue to a question that Caroline asks, which is um, in academia and, and I'll add maybe even in research more broadly, even beyond academia, what are the best ways to bridge the gaps between environmental science and public health? That's a good question. I'll, I'll go back to one of my previous soapboxes. We don't have funding. I've been working in this field for about 25 years, and this has not been a career choice. I've trained many people. I've Right now, I'm training students who really want to go into this field. But how can you go into a field when there's no positions, there's no research funds? It is a really big challenge. Many of the current researchers working around climate change and health are in departments of geography. Schools of public health, academics and schools of public health most of them will never have tenure. They're not a tenure based system. You have to raise all your own salary, plus a salary to support your students, plus salary to support administrative help and others. Schools of geography have a different model where many of the academics do end up getting some level of tenure. So I know based on the number of students who contact me, there's enormous interest from students in going into this field. And all of them worry about what's gonna happen when they go out and there's no positions. Changing that so that there was a demand for people with this training where there was research funding would fundamentally shift the whole training situation Quite a few years ago, there was a joint call on climate variability in health for five years. It was NOAA, NASA, NSF, EPA, and then a private research institute. So it's a public-private partnership. And it had very tiny amounts of money. And that call for five years trained most of the researchers on climate change and health in the US. It was required to be multidisciplinary. So universities really made an effort to make sure that they had the partnerships that were needed. And you know, five years is a long time for any kind of collaboration to hang together across federal agencies. And it was very, very successful. And we need more of that. We need to help ensure that the funding breaks down silos and we start crossing these disciplines so that we can address the challenges of this century and not just the challenges of the last. 
Wow. Uh, thank you for, for sharing those insights. And that would be like an incredible place to stop here, but we still have a couple minutes left and there are okay. some other questions. So I'm going to ask you another one. This comes from Chris. Um, she says, obesity rates are rising in the United States. Could you comment on the connection between air pollution, particularly ground level ozone, and the struggles um, to address obesity? That's a good question. I don't work a lot on obesity other than obesity is a risk factor, that people do a lot of work directly on air pollution and obesity. From a climate change perspective, we focus on ozone. Ozone, as you know, is formed on clear cloudless days. The rate it, it's formed is temperature dependent. So all else equal, higher temperatures, higher ozone. And that affects everybody who's got any kind of lung issue. And it is a short-term and probably also a long-term problem for people who've got lung issues. And many people with obesity do. And obesity plays in then to a number of ways that individuals are vulnerable to changing climates. I do a lot of work in the Pacific I think it's 75% of all Pacific Islanders are overweight. I forgot exactly the prevalence of obesity, but incredibly high. Three quarters have hypertension. And you start seeing these various health, underlying health risks come together. And so thinking about what you do, for example, during a heat wave and how you make sure you protect people or you have a storm surge associated with the hurricane. And we don't differentiate particularly vulnerable groups very well. So we just basically tell everybody they all have to do the same thing, not recognizing it is more difficult for some people than others to, for example, go to a shelter. And if they do go, they better take medications and think about ways to help protect people when they, for example, go to shelters or they have to take other actions. So it didn't directly address that question, but it is acknowledging that that is an important area. And finally, to go back to my previous theme of my experience with giving talks to the public, to students, is everyone comes up with these really great researchable questions. And I keep coming back to, we have to have investment in this area because those questions are real, they're urgent, we need to find ways to better manage those, to better prepare people so that health systems know what to do about this. And someday talking about it will turn into something more than just talk into real action and real answers. I think maybe that's, maybe that's um, a general theme for 2020, the fact that we can start going beyond talking about really important systemic problems and addressing them. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Christy Ebai, for, for sharing your time with us today and, um, and helping us understand a little bit more about how climate change and public health intersect. Um, thanks also to our captioner, Tammy Burnham, um, who's been doing this for us all week long. We very much appreciate it. Um, and thanks to all of you who joined us uh, today and throughout the week to uh, learn about these topics. And um, we hope that you'll join us for future events. We, of course, do this big week-long series every June, but we also offer other programs throughout the year. And um, you can sign up for Metcalf Institute's monthly e-newsletter to stay on top of those things. And uh, one last reminder that we always post these videos on our YouTube channel. So you can always find them there and please share them. Um, the, the more everyone can, can know about these things, the better. And with that, again, thanks to uh, Dr. Ebai and wish you all a good, good day. Happy Juneteenth. Thank you so much.